the scent of her powder. She'd been dead for 15 years, but like if I opened that drawer, her rings and her little jewelry box and her powder and like the scent would waft up and it was as if she was just down at the grocery store. Look at him, oh my goodness. This room, the bathroom at my mom's place is unique in that it is very organized and very sparse. My mother remodeled it. She picked out the paint that you see and she went with a sand and a sky beach theme. And she had some plumbing done that was fairly expensive and she picked out the vanity uh, she picked out even the toilet and the floor. Um, and she's kept this room very, very sparse and neat and organized and lovely. And it's relatively clean. Want to tell me a little bit about this bathroom? Yes, it was the beach. It had to be the beach to give you a feeling of space. And it had to be warm with the brown. So you felt cocooned in the wintertime and it had to be kind of emptied so that you could cleanse yourself like a spa feeling. And it's like six feet by seven feet and you wanted it to feel like a spa. Why? That's why I kept trying. And this should be painted nicely, but we never got around to that. That's disgusting and needs to be fixed, but the rest of it is the spa. Well, I love what you did with this bathroom. I love the remodel. I love how you keep it. And uh, to, to you, is there any difference between this room and the rest of the home? Uh, uh, not really. So a question I have, I mean, to me, there's just such a stark contrast between that bathroom that's so open and inviting and, you know, situations where there's clearly like works in progress and um, it's just hard to get around. Earlier today, we spent a while, this table didn't have any free space on it, so we cleared some off so we could eat food and take some notes. Um, but yeah, just a question I have is, do you feel a difference between that bathroom and the rest of this home? This is kind of a, as I was talking about, it's like the ocean of the government and everything. I've got uh, things here I have to deal with that come through the mail. You're, you've got five days to respond to this and it's a voter thing, it's extremely important. If you care about Israel or if you care about the Republicans or if you care about school, there's all this stuff that I just hang on to trying to keep up with, but I don't very well keep up with it. So this is the me failing to keep up with, but nevertheless wanting to. Yeah, and I think and we can all relate to that idea. And this represents the lack a lot of places have uh, a built-in cabinet for uh, the DVDs and things. Uh, these are my cherished uh, things from days gone by. Well, not this, but it's covering some. These are these are some things that my grandparents loved and some little. How does he work? It's just so silly little things that I'm keeping. And you, were, and you were describing to me, Mom, a concept that I found interesting the other day. So I'm house sitting over in Boise, Idaho. And while there, of course, it's someone else's home. And so I just have my stuff in a corner. And my mom was telling me that she feels the same way, that in some, even though her parents have passed on and her grandmother's passed on, the people who used to live here have all passed on. She feels like she's living in their home and doesn't want to disturb it. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah. I, I spent a lot of my life uh, not really having anything except be living in a rental house. Your dad and I moved one in two years. We moved seven times once. And to finally be able to keep stuff, uh, especially things that that 
I can just open these drawers and feel in touch with, I know it's silly, I can just feel in touch with, uh, you know, my grandma made a lot of these and my mother uh, wasn't so good at it, but a lot of these my grandma actually made. And how often do you go through and touch these things? I know they're there. So you don't touch them? Not very often, but I remember how upset I was when I came home one time and Brent had emptied out all of my grandma's stuff from her top bureau, the top drawer of her bureau, because the scent of her powder, she'd been dead for 15 years, but like if I opened that drawer, her rings and her little jewelry box and her powder and like the scent would waft up and it was as if she was just down at the grocery store. So I don't know if everybody keys into that kind of thing, but... Um, so that was important to you, to be able to smell as such a yeah. good reminder of and a now memory. That, now that I've put it in into the other drawer, yeah, it's all there, but it isn't the same as, as everything the way my grandma had used it. And that's important to you, is to be able to access that memory it put me back as a 10-year-old child. I was I was a 10-year-old child again, opening, because she she always had, wherever we lived, she would lay everything out a certain way, and she had her little pin that she wore at her collar, and that was in there, just little her trinkets, and, and uh, I guess, if I had issues with my grandma and issues with my mother and issues with my grandpa, you know, maybe I wouldn't feel that way, but they were always safety and uh, generosity to me and kindliness to me. And so to go back into that time when the whole world was safe because grandma was in charge and nobody would mess with grandma, you know. Yeah, you've, you've spoken about this many times before, this idea that uh, you enjoyed your childhood so much that there are aspects you're trying to preserve. I'm not quite capturing how you say it though. Well, it's not just keeping their memory alive, but it is keeping alive their tradition of something, just something of the tradition. I can't play the fiddle. My grandma learned from her mother and father how to play the fiddle so she could keep that tradition alive and she knew all their songs i didn't have a memory for those she could have sung her songs to me 20 times i can't remember the words i have very little you know i can't play those records anymore either they're down in the basement and i don't have a phonograph so i can't put the music on that they used to listen to but i can go put my hands on a doily or I can go open that and you know but I don't have to because I know they're there so I am still walking around in their world and it's safe if you go to the architectural digest magazines and they'll have some old pile that's what they call them in England some big old house and they'll have stuff that their great-grandpa gave to their grandpa, that their grandpa gave to their dad, that their dad gave to them. And they're comfortable living that way. It's here in America that we want to get rid of everything. And, you know, when someone dies, you get rid of all their stuff. And, you know, that gives you a clean break and all this. But not everybody... Do you, do you think people do that? Do you think there's people out there who... I think there's a lot of pressure on you to... I've had neighbors say, well, why don't you decorate to your own taste? I don't know. I, I don't really know what my taste is exactly. I go through the Architectural Digest me magazines and I like this modern home with hardly anything in it. And then I like this, you know, English Tudor whatever with all kinds of bric-a-brac and, you know, things from other lands and, you know, stuff from India and stuff from Japan and... You know, I, I like all of those things, but I really like the stuff that my folks had because it, I loved them so much and I miss them. And to be able to, you know, Louis spent 
hours and hours and hours and hours sanding this table and he'd, he'd finish it and then he'd sand that finish and then he'd finish it again and he'd sand it. He had it like glass and now it's got a big scar in it, but that's okay. But I mean, Louis put, I don't know, a month's worth of work on the table. My mother bought it with her uh, waitress money, with her tip money, because they lived where they had estate sales. And so she got this from estate sales there in Santa Barbara. And so these, these things were hard won. They carried these things from Montecito to Carpinteria to Summerland to Mesa, Arizona to Buell, Idaho to here. All of the stuff that's theirs, they transported all those ways and with my grandfather having emphysema and being very sickly. So it's been hard won stuff. It's been hard won. It's not cheap. You know, I don't know if I could get much money for it. You, these things, you can't get, they, you find them all the time over in the Idaho Youth Ranch. Maybe if I got $200. But to me, they represent so much of their self-sacrifice. And before, uh, when the video cut out, you were also talking about how just knowing that the stuff is there is a feeling of safety for you. Yeah, the, grandma might walk in and say to me, whoa, are you ever going to clean that and dust it? Or, you know, I mean, they, they could come here and recognize it's home. My grandma made those curtains. That's all that's left of them right there. And she, when they bought the house, she went, they bought, they also borrowed money to fix the house up uh, structurally and to put carpet and drapes. And my mom, grandma bought the yardage and sewed all the drapes, you know, and they paid to have somebody put carpet in. But they did the painting, they did the renovating. And one thing I noticed, uh, Mom, was you were able to talk about the bathroom very quickly. And that was like a chup, chup, chup. And that was something that you had done. So you had created this wonderful beach scene and uh, you had done the remodel on the bathroom and you were able to talk to that very quickly. And what I'm noticing out here with all this stuff is you have a lot of ways that you're talking about it. And so I'm just curious if you, uh, if you can share how you feel when you talk about this versus how you felt when we were in the bathroom talking about what you had done. History is a big subject. And this room here is history. This over here, uh, there are so many things represented on this table. There are appeals. And you have no idea how many people are living in tremendous difficulties. There's these children born with the cliff pellets. There's the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. There's the orphanages for uh, these people gonna, or the I'm orphanages. Hop in in for a second. There's you've... so many, many levels of human need represented. And I'm just going to, a quick aside here. So when my mom receives a request for money for donations, um, in the past she's given what she could and now she'll, she gets more of that because she's on more mailing lists and she no longer um, replies to all of them, but she hangs on to all of them because she wonders, hey, someday in the future I might give money to this organization, so I need to hold on to it. And so she's told me she's unable to throw away requests for donations, even if she's not donating, because like she said, like you were saying, that's what you meant by history of the appeals. Right? Yeah, they represent a, a lifestyle that I'm not used to having that kind of a disability. I mean, I'm living uh, like a king or a queen. I'm living better than Solomon did. I mean, I've got health insurance. I've got, you know, I can get my teeth cleaned. And, and there's just so many people who are just clinging. And for some reason, what's the word when you're... When you keep a picture book, for instance, archiving. I'm archiving human needs in 2020, 2019, um, um, 2018. I'm archiving 
how far away maybe 60 80 percent of the population lives and maybe I don't know it just feels right to do that even though it's going to take up a box in so the garage it'll take up a box it feels right so when uh, I'm gonna ask my question again because I think you were explaining the difference between the bathroom and here but what I had asked is how do you feel while talking about this versus how did you feel talking about your bathroom that was my original question well the bathrooms a no-brainer this is something that well, takes... Then start with that. How did you feel talking about the bathroom? It was a no-brainer. It was just something you... Blah, 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 blah. It's, it's not that hard to do. This is something that uh, I would like to address at some point in a meaningful way. The bathroom's done. Okay. This is something like a work well, in I'm gonna, progress. I'm going to try one more time then. How did you feel while talking about the bathroom. So you said it was a no-brainer, so mentally it was easy for you to discuss, and mentally this is kind of a work in progress, it sounds like. And I'm just wondering if you tune into how you feel when you're talking about this stuff okay. versus the bathroom. When I'm talking about this stuff, I am feeling a deep connectedness with other human beings. Ah, so connectivity. You feel connected. The bathroom is your solitary spa time. You know, you go I in see. there, you poop, you brush your teeth, you take your shower. It's part of your day, and it's it's gladness that it's easy to get in and out of that bathroom. The towels are where they ought to be. It's easy to find everything. It's not complicated, so you don't have to be. But this is something that. You know, I could make a life work out of it if I only could get myself organized enough. And I've got a, a book in here by a lady, <laughs> I can't find it right now, who uh, goes around and evangelizes and has healing meetings, um, Marilyn Hickey. She's got an amazing, she's in her 80s and she's like a little kid. She's bouncing around because God's doing uh, miracles in her meetings. So if I were to kind of sum up what I'm hearing from you is that this pile specifically represents some connectivity to other humans and it's a work in progress because if at some future point you got organized enough then you could start you could start responding to some of these calls for action to donate or to help in some way other humans am I getting that right yes even if I went to schools and talk to the children about some of these things and pass them all out and so each child could get one and say, when you're an adult, you're gonna to wanna to have to give. Is that something you have done before or do you have plans to no, do that? No, I, but I daydream about that. You about daydream about that. Taking, you know, maybe they already do it on television, I don't know. I mean, maybe all these things are well represented on TV and people flip the channel, but I feel like What do we teach kids? What do I, you know, we have to give back. And if a, all a kid knows is lessons in his school book and then, you know, whatever's on his smartphone, th there's kind of an emptiness about that. But kids get behind some of these very well uh, in my uh, uh, Guidepost magazine. There was like an 11 year old who got behind uh, sending money and he was he, he sends a thousand dollars a year because he goes around and he has he sells lemonade or whatever and he talks to people and gets them to sign up to give money and kids can really get excited about helping other people and being a part of so well thank you mom I feel like I understand a little bit more every time we talk and I really appreciate hearing from you today that one of the big things about this table in particular is it's about helping other people. And even though you're not taking action on that, it's the daydreaming aspect that you like and the possibility of in the future you might help. And, and I then do take some action. You do take some action. And also my mom uh, really loves to help a lot of people in the community by driving them to Boise. And she becomes a personal chauffeur for people who need to make doctor appointments to the point that I think it comes at her own expense. Um, 
not just financially, but from a health perspective, just sitting in the car so much. Uh, she not only drives them uh, more than three hours a round trip in a car, but also sits in the car quite a bit while waiting for their doctor appointment. Um, so my mom certainly does help. And hearing from her right now, I see that this, even though it looks uh, like it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, if I saw paperwork like this on my own desk, I would feel overwhelmed. That's my own personal feeling. Um, to her, it's a sense of connectedness to hope and to helping and supporting and donating. Is that is that all accurate? Yes, that's very well put. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully I could um, someday respond more than I am responding. I do respond here and there. Well, thank you, Mom. <laughs>